first part of this video we left the cupboard in a pretty rough state. In this part we're going to focus on tightening it up to take what is a scruffy looking box and change it into a nice little wall cupboard. Efficiency with hand tools is all about knowing when to be rough then knowing when to be fine. It's now time to slow things down a bit and work to a bit of finesse. Hello and welcome back. Now that the glue's had plenty of time to harden off, we're going to cut these pegs back. I'm only cutting them back at this, at this time because they're in the way. You can see it's sticking out. I'm not concerned about cleaning the side up or the top at the moment. We'll do that much later on. As it is such a bloody awkward thing to work with at the minute because of these, what it's, it's worth investing the time in finding yourself a big plank of wood. You can use a bit of plywood or MDF or anything like that. The principle really is that we're just going to hold that to the bench with a clamp or a couple of hold fasts and then slide the carcass over it. And this now gives us somewhere to work so we can now chop at these and then we can plane you know, the sides and top of the carcass. So I'll just give them a swipe, we'll set another one in. I like to use a chisel to knock off the pegs, but if you have a flush cut saw then this would work perfectly. I position the chisel bevel down and cut well above the surface. I chop from four sides to prevent the peg from splitting. The process is then repeated, this time taking the peg right down. A light pair at the end neatly flushes everything off. The result is a nice crisp peg. You may recall in part one that I mentioned that not all of the pieces for the carcass may be parallel. And whilst we could have planed them parallel, it's a lot quicker just to roughly plane to the line. But what we did do is we made a reference face and that way, whenever we shot a component to length, we place that reference face against the, the fence of the shooting board. And what that does is that keeps everything true and square to one face. So when we put this together, all the reference faces went to the back. And that means that where the rebate goes, meets the top and bottom, it's all flush. It's also got no twist in it whatsoever. So the back is spot on. However, the front is another story every joint stepped and it may even be slightly twisted which that does have a little bit of a twist in it so what we're going to want to do before we plant our face frame on this is just flush off all of these joints and get any of that twist out and knock off all the high corners first to roughly level things out Once it's looking something like, I plane right around the carcass until I get a continuous shaving. I then check for twist just by eye, pulling a stupid face ensures accuracy. Now I need to prepare the two pieces for the face frame. The plan states a width for these, but having checked out the widest board I have available for the door, I decided to increase them. My door is going to end up a quarter inch too narrow, so by adding one eighth to each frame, I'll still be able to get it from one board. I'll make my face frame using the offcuts I saved when I cut the carcass sides. Before we fix the face frames down, we want to have a good check and see how well it fits. You can do that just by putting some hand pressure on it and seeing how tight your line is. That one's spot on. Well, that was pretty good. I've left them slightly over length as well because what we can do once it's all connected and fixed we'll flatten the whole of the top and bottom as one. It's better than it ending up too short. There's a few ways we can go about fixing these on. The first is obviously just to glue it. Gluing alone would be more than enough for something of this size. If you wanted to make a bit more of a feature of it you could use some wooden nails. 
like we did on the carcass and some cut nails or blacksmith made nails they'd look nice as a decorative feature anyway I'm painting this piece the pine's a bit scabby I don't really want that on show so I'm going to paint it so it doesn't really matter what I use we're going to cover it over so I'm going to use some of these just these oval head nails and the reason I'm using them is if I'd relied on glue alone I'd have to wait for the glue to dry I'd have to have clamps on it so if I just use the nails I can get straight back on with the next step Right, so we're about ready to start cleaning up the whole of this carcass. Um, as it's still a little bit awkward to hold, we're going to use the same setup as we did with the pegs. I'm attacking all the protruding end grain with a block plane. I'm careful to lift the plane before reaching the opposite end grain. This prevents the side splitting out. I then plane it from the opposite direction. Using the side of the plane, I can check my progress and ensure that I haven't tapered the edges down. With no end grain to worry about, the sides of the cupboard are much easier to clean up. I'm not too concerned about flatness here, but I do lighten the cup to ensure a good finish. You have to take care with pine, even dragging your plane back can be enough to bugger up your finish. Before smoothing the face frames, be sure your nail heads are well sunk in. If not, you'll be wallowing in self-pity for the next week. Everything's now cleaned up, we've got the top and bottoms are all leveled off, everything's smooth. With the sides and the face frame, I was aiming at getting the best finish I could possibly get. I didn't want any tear outs or any plane tracks left in that, because even though we're painting it, it will show up. The top, I wasn't really that fussed about the finish, however what I did do was just slightly dish them. And that means when we put our top and bottom caps on, we're going to end up with a very tight seam all the way around. We are, however, now going to have to change our way of working. Now it's cleaned up, we don't want to have to clean it up again, so we're going to have to start respecting it a little bit more. I've just prepared a couple more pieces here. These are going to form the top and bottom caps. I've cut them so they've got a half inch overhang on both sides. And then I've just split them off as everything else has been done and plane them to the line so that it's got half inch protruding the front but it is flush to the back. <laughs> to my eye, at the minute, they're looking way too thick so I think we're going to have to take some of this thickness down. So I'm going for about half inch. So all I'm going to do, we could probably just do this by eye but it is a... Uh, if you're new to thickness in then it is worth gauging. And it's a good idea also to set your gauge lines a little stronger than what you're shooting for. Just do the long grain. We'll just get rid of that. And we'll get this dog down in the vise. You'll see the underside of the board rocking slightly, as it isn't flat. This is why I like to gauge the line heavier than the final thickness required to allow it to be trued up. Thicknessing is definitely a subject which I'll be covering in much more detail down the line. So we're looking much better now. 
However, I do still think that looks a bit boxy. So what we're going to do is put a bullnose moulding around the three, by the two edges and along the front. We'll do that on both of them. We're just going to use a block plane. And we'll just do this by eye. Okay, now I always start with the end grain, that way if we split anything out, we'll remove that when we come to play with the grain later on. And just sort of start at 45 degrees. Now we've just got two 45s, very roughly, and then we'll just by eye round that over. If you wanted it to be perfectly round, you'd have to probably go over that with a bit of sandpaper, but I quite like that series of flats that create the round. Same with the long grain, this is just a little bit easier though, we're not worried about it splitting. They're now ready to be fixed down but before we fix them something that is definitely worth mentioning and that is which way we orient the board i know they look the same any old way but we want to position these growth rings in the right orientation if not we'll end up with big gaps right around the edge of the cupboard i've got a piece here and hopefully you can see the very clear rings now, as this piece of wood dries out, what it's going to do, these rings will straighten. So it will actually curve in the opposite direction to the rings. So if we was to put this down with the rings downwards, we'd run into a problem where the board is going to end up cupping on the top of the cupboard and we'll have the gap. So what we want to do is position it so the growth rings are facing upwards. That way we're using that cup to our advantage. As the bud cups, it's going to tighten all of our visible seams. Positioning growth rings down like this would allow gaps to form around the joins. Sitting it this way round, like a smile, will ensure the joints stay nice and tight. I prefer to spread the glue thinly to avoid any messy squeeze out. It's also a good idea to leave a border without glue. I sit the cap on and flush it up with the back and check it's centred on the width. Glue alone would be fine here, but I'm taking extra steps and using clenched nails. I've just finished shooting the shelf to length. It's a bit of a trial and error job. Uh, just keep going back to the, the cupboard and then back to the shooting board until you get that precise fit. Now, when I cut the housings, I did make them a tight joint and we could press fit them in. However, coming to slide them in, it's apparent that they are a little bit too, t it is too tight. This side's got a bit of give in it, but this side ain't gonna go. So to rectify that, we remove material from the shelf. We never, we never try to widen a housing. So we'll just throw that in the bench. We'll just take a few shavings off. Don't overdo it, because you'll very quickly end up with a joint that's too loose. We'll give that a test.
Now again, it's still a little tight this end. This side I don't want to remove any more material, so we'll focus our plane in to this end. Another test. And that's spot on. So what we'll do, we'll just put a little cross in one of the joints. That way we know which way round it goes. So last of all, we just want to ram the shelf right in and just check it for width. It's probably slightly over. We'll just put a little chamfer on the edges. Just because there might be a little bit of glue that squeezed out the face frame into the joint. So I'll just make sure it pulls in tight. Tap. It's actually not too bad. I think we'll just take a shave in along the length of it just for look. Just a dab of glue will do here. The mechanical nature of this joint will hold it in place. The last job then before we get this part wrapped up is the back. I've already prepared a couple of pieces here. Um, they don't have to be done to any great extent, it is the back after all. One thing you want to make sure, and that is that it's it sits in the rebate. That way, when it's hung against the wall, the back isn't going to get in the way of it hanging properly. You want that to be quite tight against the wall, so it is sat in. A nice amount. Now we're going to use a shiplap joint for these two pieces because one obviously isn't wide enough. All that is really is a rebate on both sides at half the thickness. I'm not going to worry about the widths just yet. We'll put that joint on and then we'll mark directly afterwards. Now I've got a nice little trick to do shallow rebates just with a shoulder plane. So first of all I'll just run a gauge down it just over half inch or so. Do that on both pieces. Just use a pencil and just eyeball the centre. Both. So sort of use your finger as a fence. So like when we're using a philister, it helps just to flush the edge of the board up with the bench. And what you can do is use your finger as a fence. So as we're running it, we're keeping our eye on the iron, then it's running along our line, and we're just sort of free hand in the first pass. We're also going to tilt the plane up, so the corner of the plane is almost running in that line. It's sort of giving it a track. Just take it steady. Get a couple in. Then we can start to bring it in flat. And then we've got a wall to press the, the side of the shoulder plane into. It lacks like the fence. And we'll just keep going until we get to the line thereabouts. It's then just a matter of keeping your eye on the pencil line we gave ourselves just to get to a depth. We'll just run it along and that gives us a nice square wall. The same on the other one. Just to check your joint, 
and just press the two together and check it flush. So one more thing we want to do just before we nail them on is on the inside face just chamfer that shoulder of the joint and then on the opposite piece you want to just put the chamfer on the back of the joint that way from the inside of the cupboard it's just a nice neat line So there's no fancy way of fixing these, all we're going to do is nail them. The first piece we'll put in, so the rebate is, well show, you can see the rebate. And that way we can get our measurement from this wall to the side of the cupboard to cut our other piece. So we'll nail this bit on now. See how I'm leaving a gap down the side for expansion? With the first board nailed down, I can take a measurement for that second board's width, again allowing for that expansion gap. Now I live day to day, most of us live that way. We've jobs to work and chores to shirk and those bills to pay. I'm tired of this routine, I want a different scene To sit and sigh as life goes by just isn't for me Next time we're going to be taking a closer look at clenched nails and why they're still relevant to today. To download the plan for this cupboard, pop over to the blog theenglishwoodworker.com and of course don't forget to subscribe.